Hi, welcome to VMRA Healing. I am your host, Angie Schultz. Today, I have public speaker and author, Anthea McCartan. Hi, Anthea. Hi there. Do you mind sharing just a little bit about yourself and your background? Yeah, uh, so I'm a Christian, first of all. Um, I am a survivor of childhood sexual abuse. I'm married, a qualified counsellor. I now facilitate workshops and they're aimed at both survivors and those who are working with survivors. Have children, two children, adults now in their 20s. Um, that's a very long story condensed into a few seconds, but that, that's me. <laughs> awesome. So you actually wrote a memoir called How Childhood Sexual Abuse Almost Stole My Sanity and How I Overcame My Past. Um, and it's currently free on Kindle. I will have it, in the, free, in, in, in the show notes so you guys can check it out. It's definitely a quick, good read. I read it last night com incomplete. Um, so what is the message you hope that people will get from reading your memoir? I think the main message when I was, that before I even began writing, when I was thinking about writing my story, the main motivation behind it was just giving that message of hope because I remember how I used to feel when I was in the midst of that darkness, living with trauma. I just felt so lonely, isolated, but also hopeless. I just felt like that was my lot. That was my story. And there wasn't going to be any healing, any future. I, I, When I was in the midst of that, I couldn't envisage healing. I couldn't see beyond. And it was a very scary place to be. And when I was thinking about writing my story, that's, that was my motivation. I just want to share hope that um, healing is an option and it is possible. So what was the catalyst for deciding to write your memoir? Um, so I had a breakdown when I was 30 um, and I spent four years in and out of hospital or mental health ward. And then after those four years, I began to feel better what I believed to be better um, I, I think the the better word to use would be stable <laughs> I, you know it was the most stable that I had felt ever um, but for me that was a huge progress what I didn't understand was that I still had a lot of healing to do sort of a, a lot of learning um, about myself a lot of growth there was a lot to to come but I just wasn't aware of that at the time so I remember sitting at my in-laws house with my laptop and typing away and the writing was more a cathartic process it was more a, like a validating process um so I actually closed the laptop and didn't do any more writing for a few years <laughs> So you mentioned that there is a ripple effect to childhood trauma. Like this was, you're, you basically write about your childhood trauma, um, yeah. but you mentioned that there's a ripple effect. Can you describe what you mean by there's a ripple effect to childhood trauma? My goodness. It's, it's, it's uh, when we, our survivors speak about the ripple effects of abuse, it is huge. Um, especially when you're looking at the effects that it has on you as a, as an individual, um, you know, in the sense that you you lose your sense of identity. And the abuse started when I was around the age of six or seven. So my identity before that was very much one of being carefree and, and freedom and fun and happy and joy and all of that. Um, but then when you're abused, that, that all goes and um, your identity becomes something entirely different. And for me, it was one of lo low self-worth, low self-esteem, fear, um, rejection, abandonment. That that was my my uh, value system. That's who I believed I was. I was all of those things. Um, so the ripple effects on yourself is one thing. But then the ripple effects externally, when you're looking at family members, um, 
so that's my grandfather so the ripple effects on my parents on my siblings extended family um ripple effects on the relationships with those individuals it's it's vast um yeah so what was your original question what were the ripple effects yeah so you're, you're in, answering in a nutshell questions. yeah in a nutshell that's they were the ripple effects um but it, it goes far beyond that there's so it's it, your whole world changes everything yeah you, you bullied at school because um there was a vulnerability in me that believe that bullies um detected and I was an easy target so that's another ripple effect um, a consequence of that was low grades. Um, I left school with barely any qualification. So yeah, but just it just it really does go on. It really changes your whole life, every area, every aspect. I know that one of the things that I really loved about your book is the very first line, and it says, "I didn't want to. I didn't want my life to end." I just wanted the pain to end. And I think a lot of people can really relate to that. Do you mind sharing yeah. um, what caused you to say that? Yeah, so I took a choice. I had a choice when I was in the midst of despair um, that I either end my life or I just continue living in the despair. And what I didn't realise, I didn't have enough self-knowledge or self-awareness at that time to realise that it wasn't that I wanted my life to end. I wanted the pain to end. Um, but through therapy, a really good therapist, she really freed me from the shame of, because there was a lot of judgment, again, the ripple effects from family and friends. But you have so much, you know, you have two lovely children, a wonderful husband, a job, you know, some people even went on further to say, you go on lovely holidays, you have a lovely car, you have so much going for you. Um, yeah, so it, it, it really was about wanting the pain to end rather than my life to end, because even I was able to acknowledge that, you know, people looking in on my life, it looked good. And I knew that, I knew I had a wonderful husband and two lovely children and, everything going for me but you cannot when you're living with trauma you cannot see beyond that I, I talked to um, Dr. Mark McNear last week and he talked a lot about the difference between shame and guilt and I think a lot of people don't realize you know what shame is and how he explained it was guilt is feeling bad about something that you did where shame is feeling bad about who you are and oftentimes what we feel shame about has nothing to do with anything that we did, it usually has something to do with what happened to us. And um, I just thought that was a really good description. I also, one of the things I really appreciate about your book too, is it talks, uh, freedom seems to be a huge theme in your book, um, feeling free. Can you define what freedom was to you and how you achieved that? Gosh, that's a really big question. Yeah. Um, I mean, I can speak about the here and now and what freedom looks like for me now. But it's very different to how freedom, how I envisaged freedom to be when one, when I was broken, but two, when I was working through the healing process. Uh, healing now for me is, is wonderful. Um, I learned to ride a motorcycle <laughs> five years ago. And that for me, it's not, I mean, yes, the experience of riding a motorcycle is, is awesome. But when I go back five years ago, even to contemplate, right, I want to learn to ride a motorcycle. That I mean, in the UK, it's quite a lengthy process. We have to do a CBT, that's for two years. We have to do a theory test, and then we have to do um, a direct access course, which has a mod one and a mod two. It's, it's not an easy process to learn over here and get your full license. And I knew that. And... When we, you know, we earlier we were talking about the ripple effects and we we're talking about self belief and self confidence and even self worth. Am I worth this? This fun factor or element in my life, you know, I've got so many other responsibilities and the cost and everything. So I really had to take myself back to all the work that I've done. I am worth this um, and I can do this. 
but the uh the beliefs the old belief system is always there you know i think we ask the wrong question sometimes many people ask me clients some people who work with survivors you know how do you know when you're healed it's not so much about i'm healed now it's an ongoing process every day we are always healing and working through things and when things like this come up where right i want to gain full motorcycle license i had to quieten not just quieten but turn the volume off to all those old negative automatic thoughts of I'm not worthy of this or I won't be able to do it. I will fail. Um, you know, my husband, he, I'm, I'm so blessed. You know, he offered to pay for it all. And then if I fail, it's a waste of all that money. So I had to turn off those voices from the past and um, remind myself of all the work that I'd done. <laughs> Uh, so that's how freedom looks for me now whereas when I was still living with the trauma freedom was part of the healing um and it, for me it just meant free from the pain free from the torment um that's yeah what were some of the things that you chose to do to help you achieve that healing I know you're not you will never fully be healed until the day you die you'll not Absolutely. fully be healed. what are some of the things that you have done to help you achieve greater healing so the first thing I did after sort of the, the four years of being in and out of hospital mental health ward um I um, again I was turning off the volume to those those old voices from the past and I um, decided to qualify as a counsellor so that was four years of training um, and actually those four years I did so much healing work um, although the therapy that I'd had previously was was really good in um, validate, validating my experiences, um, acknowledging that they had happened, you know, the therapy helped me work through anger and things like that. Therapy uh, or qualifying as a therapist, those four years, there was a lot of self-awareness work and we really had to pull ourselves apart and really look at our behaviours and our thought processes and um, who we were in our interpersonal relationships and things like that. So that was a really pain. Although I, the best four years of my life, I have to say, I really enjoyed those four years uh, qualifying, but it was so painful. Um, so I'll, I'll give you one example. Um, when I was broken, I, the way I dealt with or responded like a trauma response, if you like, to um, things that happened in my marriage, if something kicked off, I would shut down and um, I would alienate my husband. I wouldn't talk to him. I'd go quiet and I'd go inside myself. <clears throat> and we were one day, my husband, my daughter and myself, we were out having dinner and I can't really remember the conversation, but there was a conversation that happened where um, I found it quite triggering because of one of the lines um, my daughter said, and although she didn't mean anything by it, um, my daughter is, oh, she's lovely. She's, there's always banter with my daughter, you know, um, and we have a really, really great relationship. But there was a line she said, um, well, we were talking about, yeah, church, and God loving everybody, you know, even the unfavorables or who we deem to be unfavorable or we don't really gel with. And, and, and Millie said, yes, and God even loves the Antheas. And I, this was when I was training to be a therapist and it really was textbook, right, let's I, re I really recognised, whereas before I wouldn't recognise my trauma responses, I really recognised what had happened in that moment. So I went, I walked away from the table, got myself a coffee and thought to myself, right, how did I used to respond in these situations where I feel triggered, where old little Anthea feels triggered, you know, if she's not of value and, and, and little Anthea is unlovable. Um, I know that's not true. And I know that's not what my daughter meant. So how do I deal with this? Now, I, this is, this is, I'm finding a new me. This is a, a whole new territory that was alien to me of, of actually putting my adult head on 
and what I'd learned and putting it into action rather than reacting because it was the reacting that had got me into trouble many times in the past. So I thought, no, walk away, think, pause, and then I relax. Like, so I went back to the table and I said to my husband and daughter, right, what, what you just said there, um, this isn't a an accusatory comment. I'm not saying this to point the finger. This is actually quite a happy moment for me because, and then I repeated to her what she said and how I would have responded to that. And I said, but now I'm realising you were just being you and it was banter, if you like. Um, and it was kind of a, cel- a celebratory moment of, this feels awesome. This is what healing feels like. I, 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 I'm not going to send you to Coventry. I'm not going to sulk. So, yeah, that was, even now, look, you can see, it just makes me smile just remembering that day. And just, that was freeing. You know, we were talking about that word freedom. That felt freeing to be free from the old self. Yeah. That's That's so awesome. Another thing I noticed that was a big theme in your book was you often talk about loving little Anthea and um, yeah. What, what type of work did you have to do to learn to love her? And what did, when did you recognize that you needed to love her? Yeah. Yeah. That's a really uh, powerful question because one example that I use quite frequently is when I was writing my book and we did, when we were training, Um, there was so much in a child work that we did theoretically you know in theory I had the knowledge there but I hadn't made that connection with little Anthea although I knew and understood in a child work I hadn't personally made that connection with her and I was writing a book with my um, ghostwriter Marnie and I knew that I had to do some research. So I got all the old family videos out and uh, there was one particular bit on there that used to make me cringe. And uh, it's where we're at the park with my parents, my nan and my siblings. And I'm doing cartwheels and I'm doing the usual, trying to get attention and validation. And I was like, daddy, watch me, watch me. Because he had... He used to work for a company called Radio Rental. So he was quite lucky and had a video camera. It was back in the 80s. Massive thing it was. Um, but anyway, he was recording all of us. But yeah, my, my insecurities and, you know, that old message of I'm not lovable and not worth being filmed. Daddy, daddy, watch me, watch me. And and it used to make me cringe every time I watched it. Um, and anyway, I, I put the the videotape in the machine and started watching it again and I was on my own and I just cried and for the first time I felt empathy for little Anthea I felt compassion um and there's a friend of mine she's a therapist as well and uh, I would liken it to her analogy where she said she would literally picture having her little self on her lap and giving her little self a hug. And that's why I was crying that day because that's in that moment, that's what I was doing instead of feeling repulsed by, because when I looked at little Anthea, all I saw was ugliness and pain and uh, someone who was annoying and um, irritable to, um, somebody that was yeah, just annoying to everybody else as well, as well as me finding her annoying when I was watching her and I and that just switched it flipped to oh god I love you you poor thing it was not in a condescending way but it was again a freeing moment where right now I can start doing some real work with or together we can start doing some real work together that's beautiful that, that was a turning um, point yeah so you had described your diagnosis, I don't know if it was a formal or informal, but as complex trauma. Do you mind describing what complex trauma is and how um, it affects someone, specifically you or people in general? Yeah, so when I was in hospital and I di- diagnosed me, I remember the, the first day um, I was admitted and they actually asked me, why do you think you're here? And I was very flippant in my response, which was, well, I don't know, 
I went through a list of uh, things that had happened to us that year as a family, which was a car accident, a really uh, nasty car accident in Austria. I'd made my best friend's wedding cake. There was all sorts of things that were going on. And I really genuinely believed that everything had just got on top of me and I broke. Um, and they said, well, they're all triggers, but there's something else. <laughs> and very flippantly, I just said, well, I shrugged my shoulders and it was, well, I was abused as a kid. I had no idea what I had been living with. Um, so that's when they diagnosed me. Um, and also um, they diagnosed me with um, obsessive compulsive thoughts um, because the religion and the trauma together was not compatible at that time. Um, any anyone listening who has been raised in any type of faith really would understand that religion and the teachings can actually magnify the shame that um, you're living with as a survivor of abuse. Um, you know, there's all that talk about around grace and forgiveness, and I couldn't even forgive myself um, for much of what had happened I blamed myself for not being able to say no or not being able to push him off or not reporting it sooner or and I had to forgive myself so when you're looking at complex drama you know when we were talking about the ripple effects and it, it's just such a vast topic and um, but that was my first um experience and moment of you know, being sat in that hospital room of realising that I was a victim of complex trauma. Um, yeah. And you talked a little bit about religiosity. Um, I think it's the same as scrupulosity here. I think it's a UK, United States difference. But um, one of the things that you had talked about is because your family, it's not that they didn't take you seriously. It's that you guys were so immersed in church culture and um, religion. And you mentioned that they had a very naive interpretation of what God's forgiveness is. Um, do you mind yeah. sharing that? Because I have a feeling so many people can relate to that because I think so many people, you know, they think they just need to forgive everybody and what, and they don't have an idea of what forgiveness actually truly is. And it's not necessarily yeah. the, you may stay in my life, even though you did all these terrible things because I forgive you. Um, do you yeah. mind just sharing the impact of that and your thoughts on that? Yeah, of course. The impact of that was um, huge, to be honest. Um, so I, when I had the breakdown at age 30, um, not too long after that, my grandfather um, decided he was very manipulative and always coming out with lies, but he decided that he wanted to become a Christian, but not only become a Christian, but attend my church, which was my safe space. Um, and where I was still broken, I was unable, although uh, my mum and the then church ministers asked me, would this be okay? The broken me, who didn't have a voice, said, yeah, of course, people pleasing. Yeah, yeah, of course, I'll be fine. Um, so not only had I lived the trauma of what happened in my childhood, but then I had to continually be re-triggered by him being in my life. Obviously, throughout my whole childhood, you don't have a choice. You're a child, so it's continual triggers of what had happened. And then the breakdown. He didn't even come and visit me in hospital, in the mental health ward, um, and then attended. So I had no, no freedom from him and from the memories of what happened. Um, and then at that time, what was also being um, said to me was that in order for you, or you'll understand this, um, one of the church teachings is that if we don't forgive others, then God can't forgive us. And as a victim of abuse, I, I knew that I just could not find it within me to forgive him. Um, as, as hard as I tried, which magnified the shame again. 
whatever um, way I looked in, in those years, there was shame, different aspects of it, but there was always shame in different contexts. But so that was one. And then when um, I began therapy outside of hospital, there was a line that my therapist said, which began the whole different thought process of, is he worth forgiveness? And the question she asked me was, does he deserve the title granddad? Because up until that point, I was still calling him granddad and he was still in my life. Um, yeah, so it, I've, I've got to be honest, it took me years to process that real uh, message behind forgiveness, to process what forgiveness really meant, to process what forgiveness looked like during my healing process. Um, but what I now understand and what I teach or bring to the table when I'm talking to survivors and people working with survivors is that one of the most harmful things we can do is to tell um, a victim survivor that they have to forgive their perpetrator or abuser if they are to heal or find healing. And I think that's really damaging, a very damaging message um, because it definitely damaged me um, because I knew I could not forgive him. Um, and there's one, there's a scripture that many Christians seem to forget. <laughs> Um, it's in oh gosh Luke 17 um, where it's I wish I'd had it in front of me now but it's something like um, if they are repentant so whoever's whoever's in your life that's hurt you if they are truly sorry and as we know statistically abusers rarely are sorry and repentant and don't want to change and don't change um, so he, he was another freeing process for me, realising that actually I'm already on my healing journey and I've already worked through so much and processed much and I haven't forgiven him. So do I actually need to forgive him? And it wasn't so much that, it's, you know, because people say they're talking about angerness and resentment and bitterness in your heart and... I didn't have any of those things. I wasn't angry. I'd gotten to the point where I'd let go of the hurt and I wasn't angry anymore. I was, I'm trying to think of the word, indifferent. Um, I, there really was no feeling. There was no attachment to him. There was no emotion there anymore. I'd, I'd been able to walk away, or as I word it sometimes, the crime scene. I'd been able to walk away from that. Um, without holding the angerness, bitterness and resentment that I used to, because I did used to be very angry um, and resent what I had been robbed of. But I'd gotten to the point where I was walking in healing and freedom and full acceptance of what had happened, but I hadn't forgiven him and that was okay. So yeah, that's my, my main message really, I think, you know, if you're a professional working with victim survivors and especially if you're um, if from any faith, and um, especially mine, Christianity, I, I, I know not every listener may agree with this, but it's, and I'm not here to preach, but it's my experience and that's what we're here to share. My experience with forgiveness is don't tell a survivor they have to forgive. I know one of the thing, one of the damaging things that I have heard in church is about. I've actually heard pastors say that there is no godly anger. So if you're feeling angry, you are sinning. And I have to admit that in my own journey of healing, I had to feel angry. It was because, like, I had told myself I could not be angry at these people. I had to forgive them, you know. And so I didn't. So anytime anger would arise, I would I would squash it down, and. I was losing my voice and it wasn't until I allowed myself to be angry and even at angry at people who are very healthy in my life. Um, I had to be, I had to be able to be angry with them for things that do, because, you know, if you're in a relationship with anybody, no matter how great the person is, they're human, they're going to hurt you. And yeah. I think too often the church tells us not to be angry 
And I think sometimes we do have to be angry in order to move on or to realize, you know, we have worth, we have um, a voice. And I think that, you know, it's about not staying there is what it really is moving on. Yeah, it is being able to walk away and letting go of everything um, that was attached with that that chapter of your life um and anger is for me it yes i i used to in personally speaking i used to my opinion of anger was it was something to be afraid of um because i didn't feel in control of those emotions um but i remember one day it was the day i reported him to the police as an adult Um, he'd said something like she came onto me or she started it and something just snapped in me and I was angry and there was no no control over that emotion that that was there so to then shame somebody and say that's wrong to be angry (laughs) that was a normal response to to what had happened um but actually I was able to turn that anger into something positive and that something positive was a moment of self-validation and say, actually, I have a voice now and I'm going to report you to the police and what you did was wrong. Um, so I think that when we react to anger, it can be quite harmful. But when we take a moment and think that and you, there's a lot of energy that's running through our bodies when we're feeling angry. But if we can stop, pause and not react to things and situations and actually think about, right, how can I use this energy? Um for something positive, a positive move forward, step forward, then anger can actually be a really good thing. What would you say your turning point for your healing process was? When did when when was the turning point? Oh, um, there were so many turning points because there have been years of healing, um, years of having to process different things. Um, the list is endless, but to Name one moment. I think it would have to be back to that moment I mentioned earlier when that therapist said to me, does he deserve the title granddad? Because up until that point, I I didn't exist. Um, I had no voice and I, I wasn't even able to think for myself. But that was a that that was the first moment um and I was about 30 mid 30s where for the first time she was encouraging me to think for myself and yeah I would say that was the first significant turning point of many (laughs) good you had you had mentioned a few in your book you had a few notations about you know little words of wisdom And one of the things you talked about is watching for signs in your children, their behavior changing, the relationships, like unusual relationships with um, other people. What are some red flags that you would like parents to know and to look out for? I think this is a really important thing to cover because when you look statistically, over 90% of uh, victims of child abuse know their abuser. Um, and one of the things that my parents said that looking, although they couldn't see the red flags at the time, because this is back in the late 70s, early 80s, when this topic was not discussed, um, it, it was brushed under the carpet everywhere. Um, but they, they, they described how looking back now, they can see the red flags. Now they're more informed and they know the subject they so things like when I before I was six they said you know you were you were happy you were confident when you had your first day at school you went and you didn't even look back you were so excited um I had lots of friends and then there was a moment that they remember too where I all of a sudden became introverted very shy, had no confidence, no friends. So when you're looking or talking about signs, their signs that they're not necessarily, it doesn't necessarily mean that your child has been abused, but they're signs to look out for if they are. And um, yeah, like I said, just 
one minute they're extroverted and then all of a sudden introverted and shy and no friends, uh, scared to see certain people. If one minute they're happy to see that person and then they're scared and they don't want to go near them. They sound very basic, don't they, those signs? But sometimes we just miss them and we'll brush it off as something innocent or something different. But we, as parents, I think it's our responsibility responsibility to be mindful of um, changes in our children's behaviours um, as, a, as a, a little individual, but, but also how they are with other people around them. I know a lot of that has to do with grooming. Can you describe what grooming is and what to be watching out for? Yeah, so... In my situation, the grooming was, I have three siblings, but I was my grandfather's favorite, inverted commas, and I would receive at Christmases or birthdays, bigger gifts, better gifts. And my siblings would always, and this is another red flag, if you like, to look out for. Their gifts were significantly smaller or cheaper or didn't cost as much as mine um and then I would get extra pocket money um and I do um describe all of this or go into detail on this in the book um but I remember one situation where my grandparents were babysitting and he came up to the bedroom um and the fear in that moment was um indescribable but he didn't do anything but that time he just slipped 50p in my hand and went shh don't tell your sisters um so that's that's one way he groomed me and another way was just making me feel really special and I think this is just one of the contributing factors to how or to explain why I struggle to break the bond and the tie with my grandfather because he used to make me feel incredibly special because of the time that he wanted to spend with me. He would give me cuddles and not my siblings cuddles. He'd take me on fishing trips or take me to the shop for sweets. And when you're looking at grooming, that is what grooming looks like. Um, so, you actually are working on another piece right now. It's called It Hurts to Heal. Do you mind describing what that is and how you plan to use it for um, to help others? Yeah, I um, for in, in my early um, years of healing, I was quite frightened of it because in, in those first therapy sessions, it was looking at um, what had happened to me and acknowledging what had happened to me. Um, and that word victim held a very oppressive, uh, had a very oppressive connotation for me. Um, and it hurt um, to, to, to first acknowledge that, that I was a victim and to acknowledge what had happened. That was really painful um, because it made me feel powerless. It, it, it was like a trigger of, of how I felt powerless as a child I again felt powerless as an adult um that hurt and um, and then when you get deeper into therapy I had a really great psychotherapist um and we were looking at how the abuse had shaped me as an individual um so we really were looking at those insecurities uh fear of rejection, fear of abandonment, how um, it was affecting my relationships, how it was affecting my career, um, how it was affecting raising my children, how it was impacting the children themselves because they were being raised by a mum who was who was broken. Um, and, and it was like putting on new glasses and, and seeing things for the first time and, and what I was looking at in the mirror was a, a, a visually was or metaphorically was very hard it, I what I was seeing wasn't something pretty or beautiful and when you're faced with all, with all of that with all the ugliness with all the shame um with who you are in that place of brokenness 
um, you just want to look away, you know, you're automatically, actually it's just to flinch away because you just can't bear to look at it. Um, but then you're beginning to think about, right, okay, I don't like it, but I want to change and I know I don't want to stay in this place. I've got to, I've got to start becoming self-aware every day and really looking at what this brokenness is looking like looking like in my daily life so I had to very slowly bit by bit and it was baby steps um change how I was feeling about myself um my thought patterns those negative automatic thoughts um so bringing that all into my consciousness because up until that point, it had all been buried. I'd suppressed it all. It had been in the subconscious. So I had to, it was all buried. So you're literally digging it all out, dragging it all out. Um, and that word shame again. Oh gosh, do I really react that way? Oh gosh, did I really say that? Um, did I really let you down here? Um, right how can I change that so that hurt (laughs) that 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 whole process um was painful because I would have to revisit the same things over and over and over but the more we revisit and change the more those um changes become habits and you're not thinking about it so much yeah so that's why healing hurts It's, it's a personality transplant there's, when there's, you're actually, yeah. there's yes. actually a song out by, I think it's called Blue Eyes. It, it does have some strong language in it, but it says, you know, healing hurts sometimes. Well, it actually says healing something hurts sometimes. And yeah. the first time I heard that, it was it was so beautiful. And it said, um, healing is harder than a full-time or work harder than a full-time job. And I, when I was in my deepest moment, even though I do not like that type of language, I had to listen to that over and over because it was, yeah. it was so incredibly powerful to me to hear her, hear that song. And if you've never heard it, I would Google it, oh, um, I know. Yeah. but it, it has strong language, but it also is very, um, intentional, strong language yeah. too. Like, yeah. But I really appreciate that you've been on here. Um, But I do want to ask one last question. And what message would you like to give to others who have had similar backgrounds as you? Um, It's there's a book, isn't there? Feel the fear and do it anyway. And um, healing is scary, you know. And we have an option. We can either avoid that and just continue in those old. The thing is that. Who I was before I found healing, although it was a dark place and a broken place, it was familiar and it was, um, I knew it and I felt comfortable with it. And even there was an element of safety. I knew that I would have to step out of my comfort zone and it was frightening. Um, So that's what I thought of that book, Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway, because you just have to, feel it that there is no option other option you have to feel it and you have to walk through that fire um yeah just feel it and do it anyway and it's what makes us all so awesome anyone who's listening who is a survivor of childhood abuse uh, to get to that point where we've survived that but what happened in our childhoods we've survived it so if we can survive that then we can we deserve this healing we deserve yes. the future. We deserve but, freedom. I like that. We deserve this healing. I like that a lot. Yeah. But thank you so much for being vulnerable on here and being vulnerable in your book. I really enjoyed your book. I finished it in two hours last night. <laughs> I was planning on just reading a couple of, or a couple chapters and it was beautiful, really written. So I ended up reading the whole thing. But oh, thank you. <laughs> but thank you again so much for being on. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. It's really nice to chat.